We're in our series continuing again today, uh, The Prophecy, The Promise, and The Prince of Peace. And uh, I hope that as we move here into Isaiah 53 today, that you'll be able to have absolute and, and total proof of the prophetic evidence of the Savior. As we examined Micah chapter 5 last week, and now we move into Isaiah 53 as we are showing the prophetic footprints. Saying that the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. This is exactly who he will be. If you examine the scriptures, there's plenty of people that will offer all sorts of apologetic evidences. But if you study the scriptures, it's abundantly clear. And so as we bring this towards Christmas in these 10 weeks, I, I hope that in, deep in your heart, if you're already a believer, you're even stronger. And if you're truly seeking truth, that you find it. And this Christmas could be different than any other Christmas. You know, as a child, uh, when an adult would uh, ask or tell my friend Chris something, they'd tell him to do something. Like, uh, I remember my... My, my mother said, don't slam the garage door. <clears throat> immediately, he asked, why? If you said, don't throw you know, a ball through my window, he would immediately ask, why? No matter what you, you, you said, he would always ask, why? And then as you clarified it, he'd ask, why again? And he continued to ask, why, over and over again. Now, this seemed to be very frustrating for the adults. But I think that Chris was really, really wanting to truly understand. And so he asked the questions. He asked, why? Why is this important for me to understand? Now, there are some very important questions that we need to ask in life. Like, why should I know about safe operation before using this chainsaw? <laughs> or why should I turn the power off before working on my appliance? Kind of important, right? Or why should I not use gasoline to start this bonfire? <laughs> Important questions, right? We can agree that why can be a very, very good question before it's too late. I've had many people ask me, why do I need to believe? Why is faith important? And so today we're going to give a reason for faith. This is really the most important question you can ever ask. Why should I believe? Why should I have faith? And Isaiah gives us a solid reason. He explains mankind's problem, and he provides the prophetic solution, the evidence for the Savior, what God has provided for us. Isaiah tells us exactly who God's promised Messiah will be. He says what the Messiah will do, why the Messiah must come, and how we must respond to it in his opening questions. I'm convinced that after you examine the evidence today, you will see clear evidence that Jesus Christ is the promised Messiah who gave his life as a willing sacrifice on the cross to pay for mankind's sins. And that all who believe in his name will be forgiven of their sins and reconciled to the Father. The question is, will you believe? Will you have faith? Let's open the scriptures. Let's take a look at Isaiah 53. We're going to read the, the uh, entire chapter, its entirety, starting with verse 1. Who has believed what he has heard from us and who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? To whom has the, the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed 
for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who cons considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken from the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of God to crush him. He had put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. There's so much in this passage, so much. We're going to break this down so we can take a look at each of the prophecies. Now, first of all, the prophet Isaiah, he served four kings in the southern kingdom of Judah and was eventually killed because of his frank statements, his prophetic words, his truth so bold to be in the courts of the kings and speaking as he did. So let's examine to, together today a reason for faith by looking at Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, the victorious king, and our necessary response. Isaiah opens this passage in really an unusual way, doesn't he, in the very first verse? Starts it out with two questions. To who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? By the end of this, I think you should be able to answer this question. He's giving proofs of the Messiah. So what does Isaiah mean by the arm of the Lord? Well, he's really referring to the strength of God's mighty arm to reach into humanity, to reach into our hearts and reveal Christ Jesus through his Holy Spirit so that we can understand and believe and have faith. And as we examine the evidence, I hope that you will be able to say, me, he's revealed it to me, to my heart, and I now believe. I can clearly see the promised deliverer the, the, to his chosen people, this is Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, which means in Hebrew, Jesus the Messiah. So let's, let's talk about the, the suffering servant as it moves right into verses 2 through 9. We're talking about the man himself at first. Verse 2 refers to a man who will grow up like a tender shoot out of dry ground. What are they talking about? Well, this, this servant of God, this, this promised king, this Messiah, this king of Israel, he will arrive at a very unexpected time for the nation of Israel. This is a time of Roman military occupation. This is a time when Israel really had no kings. And the line of David were more citizens. They were more like everyone else with, of no position. And when, when Israel was going through this time, they were really observing, as always before in the temple, the religious observations, but there was really no heart in it. 
the people were following their own ways. They were looking for their own interests. They were looking out for their prosperity in a physical sense. Things had distracted them. It was a time when things were, were, were taking their gaze rather than them turning their eyes and their heart to God. And so this nation was led away slowly into their own ways and not living for the Lord. It was an interesting time for the king of kings to arrive. When Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39 Jesus comments on this dry ground, saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They weren't looking for a Messiah at this time. They were looking for their own interests. But we know that God prospers us. Everything that we have is from him, including our talents, our gifts, our possessions, where we live, our spouse, our children. It's all a wonderful blessing from the Lord, and we should look to him. But Jesus extends this beautiful olive branch to Israel while they're at war with him, while they're rejecting him. He extends this wonderful olive branch of peace. And verse 2 says, he possessed no beauty that we should desire him. Does that mean that, that Jesus was an ugly person or that he was repulsive in some way? Not at all, right? Not at all. What it, it does say that is he came in a very humble and a very average way. There wasn't any special position where he was elevated like a celebrity above anyone else. He didn't have any special education. There was no, uh, no influence that he had on society that was uh, gifted to him other than what he gained. And so he was very average. And so it was a very unexpected way for a king to arrive. Verse 3 says that he was not really accepted. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of, uh, of suffering and familiar with pain. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. So he was looked down upon. And we see both the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the ruling Sanhedrin, they rejected him and they tried to ensnare him in, in word traps. Uh, they tried to find ways to make the public reject him and they tried to find ways in which to kill him and to end his influence. And even at his trial, the people themselves yelled, crucify him, crucify him. Matthew 27, 9 says that the Roman soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. And they put a staff in his right hand and then they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. Luke 23, 36 says that on the cross the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. So you can see that he had, the suffering servant, the man was not accepted and he was, he was rejected and he was suffering in many ways and would suffer in many ways. But let's move on to a more important part of the suffering servant and that is his mission. God sent Jesus, the unblemished lamb, as the perfect sacrifice for sin. Man could not do it for himself. And Israel themselves were familiar with sacrifices to atone for sin. In fact, in the beginning in Genesis 3-2, we see the fall of man. And who redeems Adam and Eve and clothes them with a sacrifice of an animal to cover their nakedness? And we know all throughout the Bible that nakedness is referred to as our sin being exposed. And God covered their nakedness. Then in the final plague of, of Egypt, just prior to the Exodus, each Hebrew family, they were instructed to place 
blood upon the door frames, which required an animal to be sacrificed so that they might be able to be covered and protected as they protected their family from the judgment that was going to come upon the firstborn of every house that did not have the protection of the blood. And then in Leviticus 16, we see that the high priest, he lays his hands upon two goats. One is to be sacrificed, but the other is to carry the sins of the entire nation to never be seen again. And so we see the sacrifice of the blood and we see the forgiveness of the sins that are taken away. In the same way, in a very similar way, Jesus gave his life as a sacrifice on a wooden cross, blood that was spilled for your soul and mine, that we might be clothed in righteousness, not from our own deeds, but from the Lord, given new life for our souls, that we might not experience the second death, eternal damnation in hell. And verse 4 and 5 gives us an indication that that suffering servant will bear pain and suffering on our behalf for us. He too will become like the scapegoat. He will, it says here, took upon and bore. In verse 4 and 5, he took upon and bore the undeserved punishment for him. It was our punishment that he took that we might be forgiven. And even though men were used to, uh, they were used to crucify Jesus Christ on the cross, it was really not men's doing, was it? It was God's plan. And so it pleased him. It says it was God's will to do so, his plan. And verse 4, it says, we considered him punished by God. And you remember Job's friends? They saw all the trouble that he went through and they said, surely you're, you're being punished by God. So they understood that there was, there was judgment for sin. They understood that, that, that when you sin, that you were deserving of the wrath of God. And so that must have been what he was going to experience. But we learned that that was not the case in that specific incident, was it? It was more of a, a testing than a punishment. But why would Jesus, a sinless, a blameless man, be given the wrath of God like that, like Job? Well, verse 5 tells us three clear reasons why that we should be really joyful about. He was, it says, pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced in his hands and his feet and his spirit into his side. And these symbolize the sins of the flesh that were paid in full by Jesus Christ. And we can see clearly in the New Testament in Luke 23, 33 and John 19, 34, that it talks about these that happened. So what, what Isaiah is, is talking about being, being pierced for our transgressions, we can see clearly happening in the New Testament. And he, second, was crushed for our iniquities. Iniquity is not an Act. It's not like a, a, an actual physical act. It's, it's defined as wickedness and immoral in our nature and our character. It's referring to our sin nature, that we tend to go to do the, the, the dirty things, that we just tend to slide away from God and to go in those avenues. It's our sin nature, our iniquities. And he was crushed for those. And third, he was punished for our peace. His sacrifice it propitiated the wrath of God, which means it satisfied the just wrath of God. It made the payment. The exchange was made. He struck the peace treaty for us between mankind and God. He justifies all who will believe in his name and imputes us. He gives us his righteousness. His righteousness becomes ours and our sin becomes his. It's an exchange that God was willing to make through his Messiah, Jesus Christ. And on the cross, Jesus made it very clear. He said, it is finished. That's a transactional term, meaning debt paid in full, to telestai. But only those who sign the treaty 
will receive that peace by accepting Jesus Christ's sacrifice for their life themselves. It's an open treaty that you need to sign, each of you need to sign, to be included in it. So God has offered it for mankind, but mankind's individuals need to accept. And it says, by his wounds, we are healed. That is referring to the substitutionary atonement. By his wounds, we are healed. His life for ours. The just for the unjust. Well, why did he need to do this? Because, verse 6 makes it really clear. It says, we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now you know how sheep are. When they go astray, they wander off. They, 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 they go off somewhere. In fact, they, they're so dumb, they fall over, they won't even be able to get back up. You have to stand them back up. <laughs> that describes us. We wander off. We are not going to come back home unless the shepherd comes for us and we know his name. We recognize him and we will follow him back. And so the shepherd comes looking for each of us. Verse 7 says, he was oppressed and afflicted. He was crowned with thorns. He was whipped. He was spat upon. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was, he was stripped. He was bloody. He was barely recognizable. And he was executed in a very humiliating public execution. And it says, who will declare his generation? I mean, he had no wife. He had no kids. He had no one to carry on his name. Who will declare his generation? It says he was cut off from the land of the living, meaning his life was abruptly ended, cut off. But none of this was a surprise to him at all, was it? He was a willing sacrifice. And it says he did not defend himself with any words. He was silent. Mark 14, 61 says Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. He did not defend himself. He did not want to be acquitted, did he? His desire was to give his life for you and I. Jesus hung on the cross between two prisoners and the prisoners' dead bodies. They were usually thrown in the dump afterwards, buried with the wicked, as it says, a grave of the wicked. But Jesus was buried in a rich man's tomb, which it also says, with the rich in his death. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. You can't, 800 years before Isaiah, 800 years in the future, you can't say, there's going to be a man that's going to come into this building, which hasn't been built yet. And the building is blue. And it has red carpet. And it's only open on Thursdays. He's going to come in in a, in a, in a, a yellow uh, shirt with, with, with blue flowers on it at exactly 101 p.m. And he's going to have, uh, he's going to have brown hair and glasses and, there, and he's going to have a, a, a pair of, of khaki pants on with no shoes. And, and he's, he's going to step first to the right, then to the left. I mean, there's just, you, you'd never match that up, would you? That would never happen. You couldn't predict that 800 years from now. There's no way. That is absolutely like predicting the Messiah. These things you just can't predict unless you are a true prophet. And God has filled you with his words. And so Isaiah spoke to the people of his time. And everything he spoke came true. And everything he spoke came from the word of God that was calling people back to God. And all the things in the future that spoke of the Messiah, all of those also came true exactly as they would be. 300 prophecies came true as scripture said they would because they were inspired by the word of God that might reveal Christ to us. The question that was asked up front, will you believe if it's revealed? And it's been revealed. It's been clearly revealed. It's really asking, are you willing, as Christ was willing to give his life for us, are you willing to believe and to accept? Let's talk about the victorious king. 
Because he, he came humbly as a servant, as a suffering servant, but he's also a victorious king. Verses 10 through 12 make that abundantly clear. It says in verse 10, it says, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Doesn't that sound brutal? It pleased the Lord, but no, it was part of his plan. When you see your plan coming in, I know it's rough right now, but wait, wait, this is going to be awesome. As painful as it was, it was well worth it to redeem those who are made in God's image, who were never intended for hell. Why was hell made? It wasn't for mankind. But mankind followed the exact same prideful actions as Satan and went to where Satan was intended to go in the end. Not us. But God loved us enough to make a way so we don't have to. If you go there, it's because you choose to. And if you haven't made a choice, you've already chosen. Make the right choice. There's only one logical choice based upon the evidence. And that's what we're looking at today. We're looking at a train of evidence over the last several weeks. And we're going to continue in the next several weeks looking at that train of evidence as we can see the footprints of the Messiah to come. Now, at this point, you might say, well, this could be just any martyr, right? This could just be any martyr, any number of martyrs who died for the faith. This just happens to line up. But this, this next detail, it makes it abundantly clear that Isaiah wasn't talking about just any martyr, that he was a true prophet and speaking the word of God as he was really pointing to only one man, the only one man who was ever resurrected. This, the resurrected Savior. Verse 10 says, after he had suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Well, dead men aren't satisfied. They don't see. Dead men are dead. They do not see what occurs here among those who they've, they've worked with. And Christ's works here on earth were for you, and he does see it. And so, 800 years before Jesus, Isaiah did this. He prophesied the exact details of the Messiah's crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, and glorification. That's not a little thing. Not a little thing at all. And it says that he will share in the spoils of victory in verse 12. Share in the spoils of victory. This is, this is, this is interesting. This is that, that uh, victorious king. When a king would conquer there would be the spoils of that kingdom that would be shared. And, and so in verse 12, it reminds us that Jesus was not defeated by death at all. Through his death and resurrection, he won and he defeated Satan. Isaiah says, I will divide him a portion with the great. I'm going to give him honor, respect, and my obedience. Philippians 2, 10 through 11 says, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And it says, and he will divide the spoils of victory with the strong. Who are the strong? You and I who are strong in the Holy Spirit, we're able to see truth. We're able to discern the Bible. We're able to stand against the enemy because we're filled with the Holy Spirit. Who is the strong? We are the strong. And he is, he is dividing the blessings, the spoils with us. We, his children, I'll give you proof that we're children of God. Romans 8, 17 says, if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And so as you look at all the prophetic evidence, you look at the suffering servant, you look at the victorious king, and you look and you follow the evidence trail, it leads to our necessary response. I don't want you to miss this part. If you've learned a lot and never respond to it, You've missed the whole point. You must apply the Bible to your life. Amen. And so we must take this message with immediacy and seriously. And so 
it, it was impossible for man to predict with this kind of accuracy, but it, it happened because God was behind it. And the evidence, it, it, it was prophesied to prove that Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, the promised Messiah, that you can have faith in him, that you can believe in him, and the evidence reveals it. So the next step is yours. Like the families in Egypt, they were told what to do to their house. They were told, place the blood on your family's door. Place it upon. Faith upon your heart. Place the blood upon your heart. Or judgment will come to your house. That was clear. And it's just as clear today. It has not changed. Pastor Chip said it really well. He said it's like responding to a bridge out sign. It's important. It is immediate. And you must respond to it. Or a gunman in your building. It's important. It's immediate. And you must respond to it. Or a fire alarm. Once you know in your heart, even though you may not know everything, once you believe the evidence, you must act on that. You must act in faith to save your life and your soul. So that brings us to four things. It's that simple. Admit that you're a sinner. Understand what the Bible says about our problem. Romans 3.23 says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. There's no exceptions. Second, repent, which is very simple. is turning away from your sins, admitting them and turning away from them and turning to Christ. Third, believe. Believe in Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach. He is promised. He is the promised Messiah. He is the gift of God that we could never have deserved. Salvation for your sins, total and complete forgiveness. Who would not want that? Given by God. And then receive him. And as you receive him, you receive the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to overcome for your entire life and guarantee of your eternal salvation in him. Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you will be saved. Will is a guarantee. So this is a, a very good reason for faith in Jesus Christ, is it not? When we look at the obvious need, we look at what he did, who he is, and why he did it. We can clearly see that we have received undeserved mercy and grace and love for the Father that was poured out for us, but we should receive it. Jesus willingly gave his life if you are the only one in here. So please accept them today. Will you have faith? That's the question that was asked. Will you believe what has been revealed? Let's pray. Lord, I ask if there, is, if there is a heart in here that is seeking you, Lord, I ask that you, you draw them to you through the power of your Holy Spirit. Speak to their heart today. Allow them to, to accept the love that you have for them. Allow them to believe in your name that they too might enjoy the freedom of, of being forgiven and saved and loved as children of God. And for those of us that have strayed and, and abused that freedom and abused that sacrifice, Lord, let us return. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. I would encourage you to, to try to make every single week for the next several weeks as we continue to look at the evidence for, for Jesus Christ's birth burial and resurrection and his ascension into heaven, his glorification. I, I, I would really encourage you to look at the evidence, to store up the evidence that you might be able to share that evidence with others and that you might live your life in faith, not just accepting, but live it out. Celebrate it that others may see it, the light shining in your life.